And we have a special guest, Tony Wadley has agreed to come on. He's a, a fellow Arate brother. Uh, I pinged him and he agreed to come on. He's a best-selling author, business consultant, serial entrepreneur, 365 driven podcast, world-class speaker, RK syndicate, unbelievable. You've done a lot of stuff, Tony, and I appreciate you being on. Your time. Hey, thank, thanks for the invite, man. I can't wait to bring your listeners some value and maybe get some over, get them overcoming these fears, right? Yes, I, I think fear will, fe I've, I've experienced a lot of fear in the past two uh years of my life and I, I uh, just that's a, a different podcast altogether I guess to talk about me but I um, actually originally I was going to write a book about it and then I started writing it and I'm like I don't know what I'm talking there's so many different areas of fear you know fear of uh, media fear of uh, the government uh, you know now it's prevalent with the coronavirus the media and also the medical profession like scary just everybody's scared fear is prevalent you know in that and then there's some other areas you want to talk about but maybe a quick thing about the, the coronavirus what is your take on it and, and what kind of advice can you give to people to kind of just calm down so i've got a unique perspective on that because i just spent the last 10 days in portugal during the height of this stuff kicking off here in the states my hometown is houston texas area so i was over there on vacation for my wife's 40th birthday planned event and we went over there and basically they started doing the, you know, the fear mongering of the news about two days into it, talking about canceling flights and all these different things and, you know, quarantine and all this stuff. And then that's when all the people were being dumbasses and running to the grocery store and buying up all the toilet paper, which <laughs> doesn't even have any relationship to the flu. I sometimes. know. Think about this Look, guys. If you've ever had the flu and you get the chills and you're nauseous, you're not eating a lot of food. So you're not taking a lot of dumps. So I don't, I don't even see the relationship between toilet an paper evil, and flu symptoms. So I think it's an evil plot from the paper industry. I don't know. We're supposed to be a paperless society and this is just another <laughs> thing, I think. I think it, all, it probably just started with this one old lady with a shopping cart that maybe had to stock up for a restaurant or a public facility and she bought a bunch of toilet paper at once and then the next person saw that and needed it too and then the next person needed it too and then maybe this chain reaction got on the internet, but it, it just been, it's been asinine to watch because <laughs> we're, we're in a different country watching this stuff. And, and actually, you know, for those of you who are geographically challenged, we were in, in Portugal, which is a bordering country of Spain. It's basically the West coast of Spain, that, that section. So Spain has had a lot of coronavirus stuff going on. It's right there near Italy. You know, you're, you're old, you know, ancestral country right. yourself, Michael. But the thing is, is we were, way deeper in the proximity of COVID over there. And the thing is that the people over there were more calm about it. And every night we were staying basically at a resort or a hotel and there's always TVs on in the restaurant and the bars. And you can imagine like even during these times that there's always the news on over there. And some of it was in English, BBC and stuff like that. Some of it was in Portuguese, but with the translations at the bottom. But I can tell you that the difference in how they broadcast news over there was completely different than what we usually see in the United States. They were just sticking to the facts. They weren't adding in a bunch of narratives or, you know, scare tactics and things like this. Mm -hmm. And therefore the reaction of the population there was generally relaxed and they, they took it serious. Nobody was like thinking it was a joke because it's not a joke. There are people dying. There's a lot of people getting sick. It's not a joke, yeah. but they were just concerned without being panicked. So we can right. be prepared, but we don't have to panic. Now, the United States, we're known for just firing up that whole emotional marketing campaign machine called the media and going both directions. We see it in politics. We see it in any kind of polarizing topics. And they know that fear sells. And if they can put these shock headlines on there and make you click through and go to their website, they can earn millions of dollars from that revenue from you visiting that website. And that's what they got to do. They know that hey guys, we know that we like to rubberneck here in the States. Whenever there's a car accident, we can't drive by without turning our head to see if there's any blood or gore lay, laying around and, and the whole train wreck type thing. So understanding that the media here knows that they can serve that up on a daily basis and keep amplifying that message just to really instill fear into people. And that's what's going to generate revenue for them. Because, you know, let's be honest, if the media was to remove commercials from their television, if they were to remove any ads from their website during this period, because air quotes, it is so important 
that we need to get this message out there without any distracting ads out there. We're just going to go 24 seven. We're going to report on coronavirus. We're not going to run any ads. We're going to be the, you know, the donations of the, you know, the information world. If they were to do that, they would have a little bit of honor behind them. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. I mean, it, but they're it's not. just the, the it's uh, ad after ad. They're just, they're basically just making money on our fear. It is obvious. I, I don't watch TV anymore, Tony. I just don't watch TV anymore. And the first time I saw this, and the more I, I know about it because I go to my gym and there's a big sign on the door that talks about coronavirus. Then I go on the train and then this, this Chinese lady's wiping down the seat with my wipe before she sits down. I'm like, what is this coronavirus? She's like, yes, you know, you never know. I'm like, yeah, I guess you never know. So I really didn't pay attention to it. And I was poo-pooing it. And I'm like, oh man, it's just another media thing. And it is mainly, it's a panic scare thing just to jack up revenue, I think. Uh, uh, there is something behind it. I mean, like the governor, uh, Cuomo uh, of New York, he just shut everything down uh, because he was showing a graph actually. And it was kind of alarming, like it was like zero. And then in two weeks, it went to like 2000 people getting infected. And then uh, I have a friend who uh, has a friend that works at the CDC and he's like, dude, this is like the Spanish flu and like millions of people died because of the Spanish flu. This is what he's saying. So I'm like, all right, I don't know. This is the, st the information that's coming out. So I yeah. don't know what, you know, I, I, but this is stuff that, that's being propagated to, you know, the masses. So yeah. you don't know what to think. I mean, I still go outside. I go to the store. I'm like, whatever. Like last night I had to do, I'm doing the 75 hard. I had to do my second workout. I was like hailing. But I went outside and the only two cars I saw were two police cars. That was it. <laughs> and it was me walking. I don't know if I was going to be arrested or what. So now I watch the news just to make sure I don't get into trouble. But, you know, it's just horrible. Yeah, it, it's, it's, you can watch them. I'm a marketing guy myself, you know, having built several companies and websites and things. I understand the psychological nature of marketing, but even the mm -hmm. news, the way they illustrate these these data points and these specifics on their channel is very much appealing to the emotions of fear because for example they will talk about i don't even know what the number is they'll say like thirty thousand infected in the united states in really big letters and they'll make that number that really big number in bright red font and it's like oh my god there's thirty thousand people infected and you know and then it'll say like how many people died which i think is around 400 and it's like really small letters and like in white not to get your attention because they want your attention on the big number. You know, that's yes. the fear. It's like they put that above at the top and then they never really ever show the people who have recovered, which is a pretty close number to the big number. They yeah. don't really want to put that on there because that doesn't really serve their narrative very well. No, no. And it's horrible. And then now they're saying everybody's going to get it. Like everybody's oh, yeah. going to get this virus. Like everybody. They, they, this is what they're saying. Like, like serious, like everybody's going to get it. And if you're a young person, uh, you shouldn't be out and getting it because you're going to pass it to older people like your grandparents and they're going to die. This is the yeah. stuff that's being propagated out there, which is not, there's some truth to it, but, but mostly the people that are dying are elderly people who have complications from something else. And then they Absolutely. get this and then they, they pass away, unfortunately. But it, it's just been blown. And then the, the amount of business loss revenue uh, that's going to cause I know people, like somebody was on my, I had a recording the other day. She said, yeah, my friend just got a job and he was supposed to start today. And then they called him up and they said, uh, because of this virus, we're just going to eliminate the job. Like you don't have a job. So sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you know, I, I also think that there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of things going on that we don't understand in the government and the global economy. I think that we were looking for a correction and that, that they just use this as their, their scapegoat, they probably thought it was going to be worse than it was. And they said, you know what, we got this, we got this epidemic that we can use or this pandemic that we can use as an excuse to just push the reset button and create the correction that we would think that's all going to happen. Cause we all saw the indicators. I mean, we've had oh, yeah. nothing but record, record over record stock market. Right. And yeah. you know, we see the, the interest rates dropping and all these different factors that you know, are the typical indicators for a recession coming. And we didn't really have a catalyst to cause that, but now we do, man. It's like, God, we, hey guys, this is our opportunity. We could push the reset button. And you know what? For everybody's losing money out there, there are people making a lot of money on the back end too. This so is what I'm saying too. There's, I said there's things we don't making see. making a lot of money. They're, they're honestly the people that knew this stuff that was coming out that could take this and manipulate it. They probably were hoping this would be worse than it actually is. Jesus Christ. It's just horrible. The whole thing is just... <laughs> 
Wow. But what do you do? I mean, the media has everybody gripped. They just watch TV and it's not good for your brain, either your mind. And, uh, you know, and then like me, I'm doing this anyway. My, my stupid gym clothes. Like I, I have my treadmill behind me. You can see I use that and then I do push ups, and that's like my workout. I'm trying to keep that going, you know, every day. And then I do my walks, but, uh, there's no social gatherings anymore and they want social distancing and, we have enough social distancing. Everybody looks at their phone. They don't even speak to each other anymore. They don't even have to go out for a cup of coffee. You just send them a text and say, hey. yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of ridiculous, like the whole thing. But I mean, the, the governor said, look, we're just shutting everything down and as a precautionary measure. I'm not sure how long things are going to be shut down for or how long this is going to go on for. Who knows? But nobody has that answer. And you know, here's the funny thing about it is that when, when we have people in panic and stress and anxiety, which is the state right now, the United States for sure, mm. it actually affects your physiological state. When you're in stress, you release cortisol. And let's say it's a hormone that's created by stress. And when that's in your system, because of stress, it actually reduces your immune, you know, your immune system. So if, you, if you've oh, got yeah. a, so actually being stressed out on, and being fearful of things actually makes you a, a a bigger target for this kind no, of stuff vulnerable. to get sick. Yeah. So it's kind of a, yeah, I hate to say it, it's kind of like a kiss of death type situation. And it's, it's unnecessary because the things I talk about mindset, you know, I'm a business coach, but I'm also a, a confidence coach. A lot of things I talk about and helping clients with is we can't really invest the emotional response in the things we can't control. You know, we can only control what we can control. And generally that's us as an individual. We can only control our reactions to things. We can definitely feel the emotions. We can be angry. We can be happy. We can be upset, disappointed, all these emotions. Those are normal. We can feel those. We can process those. But how we react in public, how we show a response, that's completely up to us. That's a decision. And when you're people yeah. out there copy pasting all the doom and gloom, giving us death updates instead of recovery updates and just focusing on the pessimism and the negativity that's going on out there, that's just having them focus or hyper focus on the things they're going to get more of. Because I also believe in the law of attraction. The more Absolutely. we focus on stuff, the more we get it. So if you're focusing on everybody dying, you know what? That's probably not a good thing to be focusing on right now. No. <laughs> No, it's not. And you're, you're absolutely right. You focus on the stuff you focus on is what you get more of. And if people are, are focusing in on death and getting sick. I mean, they're going to get sick. You know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous. So it's an unfortunate situation, you know, and this is one of the, one of the things you want to talk about the fear, uh, fear of death. I mean, this is a, a perfect time, I guess, to talk about it since every, they see everybody dying. I mean, there's pictures on, um, on YouTube. This is videos from Italy with coffins and people in bed and they got to turn them over. And it's just a very gloomy and people die, you know, and it's just, uh, it's, it's crazy. So what do you, what do you think about that? I mean, the fear of that, fear of death. I mean, everybody's going to die. Unfortunately, you know, nobody lives for I think that you're right. We don't have, we all have an expiration date and, and we never know when that's going to be. People pass away, you know, millions of people in this world pass away every single day from all different things. And understanding that you really got to focus on the time that you're here and the things that you can achieve and the impact that you can create while you're still alive. I know that some people want to have some posthumous fame, which doesn't even make sense because you should be making impact while you can still breathe rather than worrying about when you're dead. Me right. being famous when I'm dead really doesn't really serve me if I have the capability of doing things right now when I'm still alive and can actually contribute. So understanding that the fear of death is real. I mean, we're animals. We're, we're hardwired to survive. We, we have the, I mean, the reason we have fear is for survival. So it's to keep us safe. That's the whole ob objective of fear and, and things like that. So understanding that it's like you have to accept that you're going to die. We all have friends, especially I'm, I'm 47 now. We, we got people that are passing away in our, you know, plus minus 10 years now, especially people that we went to school with or people that are a little older or you just see it around you as you get older, you start to gain a little more wisdom and you start to value time a little bit more. But for me, it was a, it was a near death experience that caused me to really start to focus on the importance of life and impact while we can still breathe. And I can share that story if you, if you're curious about it, it's a pretty cool story. Oh yeah. I was just going to ask you, tell me about it. But that, okay. Yeah, so I'd like to know. I'm a car guy. Anybody that knows me that outside of RT and things like that, I'm a car guy. I like to race cars. I've been doing that since I was 16. And 
the businesses that I've created that made me highly successful were in the automotive performance community. So I got very good at racing cars and getting the best quarter mile times and the lap times out of them. So it's very common me, for me to go write for magazines and do these kind of things. That's what I've been doing since 2001. And in 2015, I was asked to go do a test drive for a car, thousand horsepower twin turbo car, aftermarket car to drag strip. I just happened to be at the drag strip attending an event and they, this, this, this company had a car that they were trying to roll up and get a national record with. I have a very similar car like that myself, Dodge Viper. And they said, Hey, you, you've already set records in these kind of cars. Yours is actually faster than this one. Would you mind trying to help us get across that line? And, and I was like, you know what? Fine. Cause I'm already used to the car and things like that. Well, I got in the car and I launched it, did very well. And around top of third gear, around 130 miles per hour, something in the rear suspension broke. Wow. And so for something in a rear and an independent rear suspension car, if something breaks, what happens is the wheels aren't straight like a solid axle would be. So they, they will cast her out and turn like on their own in the back. So imagine like when you're pushing a shopping cart backwards, it kind of goes where it wants to go because those rear wheels are like turning around and doing things. So what happened is something broke and I started feeling like the car was being pulled towards the right hand lane wall, which I was in the right lane. I was racing by myself, thank God. But I'm moving over toward this wall and I'm trying to keep it off the wall, but the car is still just moving towards the wall, even though even the steering wheel straight. And and I'm trying to keep it off the wall and basically it starts to, just to, to scrape down the side of the wall. So in that moment, I, I went from a little bit of fear because the car was kind of getting out of line, but I knew that I could kind of recover because I've been trained. I've made thousands of passes. It's like, it's not unusual for cars with a thousand horsepower to get out of line. You just kind of let off the throttle, try not to hit the brakes. You just kind of steer it the right way and, and it kind of corrects itself. So that's what I was trying to do, but then it got on the wall. So I went from fear and a little bit of an adrenaline rush to anger now because I damaged someone else's car. And, I, and that's kind of like, an ego thing or a reputation things. Like, I don't want to damage somebody's car. They're trusting me with this hundred thousand dollar car. Right. And so yeah. I thought the worst was over because if you're sliding on the wall, typically in a race, especially in a drag strip, you understand it's under control because it's like, it's against the wall. It's just going down the wall. So I'll just start to slow down and come off of that wall and everything should be good. Right. Well, what happens? I start to slow down and come off that wall and that rear wheel, the right, right rear wheel kicked out again. And the car went hard left because it was turning from the back wheel. Steering wheel still going straight. I'm still doing 130 miles per hour. Now I'm looking directly at the left lane wall, approaching at 130 miles per hour. Cool. With only two lanes width across from me, and I'm, and in that moment, I really thought I was going to die, Michael. I, I looked at that wall, Jesus. and I thought, you know, quick cal calculation. I'm an engineer, and I've seen a lot of people die and do these kind of things. And I was like, I muttered to myself, and I still remember like as clear as day as I said, "Well, here I go," and that's the thought that I had. And it was, it was milliseconds because the car was going so fast, but it felt like an eternity. And the thing is, is that there was no life flashing before my eyes. I didn't have any regret. And, and, I, and here's the weird thing about it is that you think about these emotions. I talked about I had fear, then I had anger because I damaged the car. And then I, now I'm aiming at a wall thinking I'm, I'm going to die, thinking, well, here I go. And the weirdest thing about that is I was overcome with peacefulness. Peacefulness knowing wow. that this was no longer in my hands. My, my steering wheel was going straight. It was, it was going towards the wall and I had no, nothing to do with it. And I just remember being peaceful in that moment. And of course, smashed into the wall and, and impact and airbags deploy and it's nighttime. So the lights are going out and then I'm, I'm hearing the car screeching and just coming apart and the car sliding sideways. I don't know if the extent of my injuries, I just knew that I survived impact. And in those moments, it was probably one or two seconds of sliding, maybe even longer. I was just, I just really focused on staying conscious because I didn't know if I was injured. I just knew that most people that from training, we die in a fire because all the fluids spill out of the engine and the gas and all the lines, like that's when people usually die is for a fire. So I knew that I just needed to stay awake. So as a car sliding sideways, I'm just thinking to myself with the eyes closed, stay awake, stay awake, stay awake, stay awake, stay awake. Mm -hmm. And the car finally comes to a rest and I had to pry the door open because that side of the car had been caved in completely. And, and I got out and I was very calm and I took my helmet off and I remember just looking at the car and there was wheels off the car. The entire front of the car was smashed in all the way up to the windshield. Uh, there was another wheel that was off the car on the right side and every panel on this car was bashed in because it hit the walls and did all those kind of crazy things while it's sliding. And so I was just standing there with my helmet off and I could hear the ambulance at the other end of the track coming down and I could hear 
people shouting and running up the track. I had friends at the starting line that were sprinting up that quarter mile just to you know get to the accident. And I could hear forerunners approaching me because they were, you know, running after me and their four wheelers. And and I was just really calm in that moment. It was just really eerie and I and I wasn't scared. And the ambulance gets there and she puts me in the back and she takes my shirt off and she's looking around to see if I have any injuries and she's touching here. Is this hurt? Does this hurt? And she's giving me inspections, checking my vitals. And I was very clear. She's asking me questions of if, you know, for concussion, you know, just asking me who you are. Do you remember that? I remember everything. Remember everything. Remember all kinds of stuff on my name, my address, everything. So, okay. And then after she inspects me, Michael, she's, she, she goes, I just wanted to point something out. And I thought she was going to tell me I had some injury or something, you know, because the way she's had a really serious look on her face. And I was like, oh, crap, you know, what's what's going on? And and she just I just wanted to point out, you know, we see accidents almost nightly out here. She goes, you are remarkably calm for someone who's been in a major accident. Like you don't have the adrenaline shakes. You don't have high you know, blood pressure is normal. Your heart rate's normal. You're remarkably calm. And she goes, I've never seen that. And And I was calm just like I was when I was facing that wall. And so it was a really profound moment for me. And that was 2015. It wasn't that long ago. And at that point, I was working oil and gas, making multiple six figure salary, had very successful businesses, already earned millions of dollars in my side businesses. And I just, I just had like an awakening. It's like, you know, why am I still here? Like this car isn't demolished and I didn't even have any injuries. I was a little sore for a week or two, had some massages to kind of get that over with, but I had no major injuries, mm. no, not even a cut. And I started thinking about that. Why am I here? Am I doing everything I need to do to be able to be here? Like, am I contributing value? Was, is this my second chance? To me, I still believe it is. And what happens, Michael, is when you start to face that kind of a situation, you realize that I was peaceful in the face of death. And I still remember that very vividly right now. So I no longer feared death. I, I was very peaceful knowing that this was probably going to be that moment that I was going to die. And I was very peaceful and I still remember that. And so I, I figured if I'm going to be peaceful while facing death, certain death in my mind, then I'm not going to fear anything. And then the next question that happened over the course of the week is like, why am I here? What am I, what do I have left to do? What do I have to achieve? Mm. Am I doing everything possible? Am I living up to my potential? Am I making a big enough impact in this world? And the answer was no. If you can push aside your ego and, and think about it really hard, you're going to answer the answer is no, unless you're really out there doing something amazing, right? And so for me, I said, okay, what would I, what would I, how would I have been remembered had I died that night? That's the thing I started thinking about because I, and then I said, okay, I have had friends that died in racing and motorcycle scene and stuff over the last 20 years. I said, how do those people get remembered? Because that's what we do. We compare. And I thought about that and I said, they would have said, Tony was a nice guy, had some cool cars, gone too soon. Similar stuff. Nice guy, cool cars, gone too soon. Kind of this reoccurring pattern. We see a lot with, lot with people that die too early, you know, not from right. old ages or things like that. I've had friends die this year from racing. That's exactly what they said. Nice guy, cool car, you know, gone too soon, rest in peace. And I, and I asked myself, is that something that it, I would be proud of? And I get it. If somebody's like a dirt bag or a low ball, like they would love to be remembered as a nice guy, but that's who I am all the time. Anyways, my entire life, I always lived that way. So I was like, that's not good enough. It's like, I want people to say that he impacted my life. He changed my life. You know, and I was like, am I doing that? Yeah. I've done that on a small scale. People that know me, I've helped other people build massive companies that were just in my proximity. But I knew that I had this information within me and the story within me. And I just knew that I wasn't confident enough to step on stage or get on a microphone or fire up a podcast or write a book. And, and basically, I didn't need to do that. I felt like I could just, you know, be comfortable, make a lot of money and just be in the background and not really have much impact because it was kind of self-serving along, along the way, chasing those dollars. And what happened is I started to think about, you know, what would I have been remembered by if I would have died that night? And when I really think about that, I think that's some exercise that everybody should go through. If you're listening to this, you should write your eulogy. Go, go sit down and grab a pen and a paper and write down your eulogy. Like if you were to die today mm -hmm. and ask yourself and be really honest. And if you don't go through an emotional breakdown or, or show some tears while you're writing that, you're probably not being honest with yourself. Yeah, you're probably not. And then and when you read that to yourself, you got to ask yourself, is that everything that I potentially could have done? Is this, is this really all I could, whatever age you are, whether you're 20 or you're 50 or 60, you're listening to this, you need to read that and go, is this everything I could have done by this time? And the answer is going to be no. The answer is yeah. going to be no. 
So I started thinking, okay, I need to go be the person. I need to become the right person to share the story and teach people the business skills. Cause there's only two things I really have a lot of passion for business and cars. Everybody knew about the car scene. I've had business as success in that. Everybody knew me as the car guy, but I was never the one standing on a stage or getting in front of the camera or anything like that. So I had to go invest and become the right person. I did the public speaking skills, joined Toastmasters, made myself really uncomfortable making videos for over a year. And just because I, I'm purpose driven with my message to help people and impact people by teaching them confidence in business. And I had to become the right person to do that. So there's my facing death story. And it, it was really impactful for me. And it's really changed my entire life since then. That's a fantastic story, man. Wow. But there's a couple things that I'm thinking about. Like the, someone said to me once about <clears throat> your tombstone, right? It has the, the, the year of birth and the year of death. And then it has a dash. What does that dash mean? What is in that dash? You know, and, and which you touched upon it. Like what, what do you want to be remembered for? Um, and Ed Milet says it all the time about uh, when he dies and he goes to heaven. His greatest fear is that if uh, God, he says, you know, welcome, good and faithful servant. Mm -hmm. And this is the man that I meant you to be. And if he looks at himself and what he did and, and he's scared that he's never going to be that guy that God's going to present to him. <clears throat> and if he can say that, then that, then that's, you know, that, that's, that's awesome. Excellent for him. But, um, one of the things, like you saw that wall, like what do, you, what do you think prepared you to be so calm? I mean, and she said that you were calm. Is there something that you have done to, I, I don't know if anybody can prepare for that, right? But why do you think you were so calm? I mean, did you ever think about that and say, wow, you know, I, mean, I really probably should have screamed or something like that? Or just, it was something like a realization saying, look, <clears throat> you know, I live my life, I'm, it's out of my control. And I can't do anything. It's in God's hands. And I, I think you believe in a universe or a God or something like that, I guess, to, 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 to kind of have that calmness in you. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that you can prepare for that. I think that's something that you have to experience to, you know, even someone that's listening this probably is like, really? Like, I can't even believe that. I, I couldn't believe that until it happened to me. So I never would have expected peacefulness in a moment of, of you know, certain death. I would have never thought about that. But then you started, so after that near-death experience and that, that, that revelation, what I started to do was I did a little bit of research. I got on Google and, you know, the next couple months and I was looking around for people who had near-death experiences and where they, you know, people have passed away and basically got resuscitated and came back and they started to share their stories of what they experienced. And the funny thing is, is they were all talking about being peaceful. All of them. Like I, yeah. like I never even studied like people dying before. I never had a need to do that, but understanding they had that as well. And I was like, so it's, it's, it's really strange. And I had another, another friend that thought he was going to pass away racing his car probably a year ago at, at a road course event. And man, his car got totally demolished. I mean, he, his brakes failed and he went head in, into a tire wall and his car went like six feet in the air and basically landed back down and it was just demolished. But I, you know, I said, you know what, can we get on a call? I'm curious about this because, you know, he's, he's letting me know what happened. And, and, and I, he hadn't heard my story yet. And I, and I said, what did you feel when you were approaching that wall? What did you feel? And he's like, I, I was peaceful. Wow. I was like, dude. And I, and I told him my story and he was like, holy crap. Like, no way, really. And I'm like, yes. Wow. So when you know that it's no longer in your control, when there's nothing else you can do, the fear doesn't really have anything to do with it anymore. Like the fear is there to protect you. But if you know, like logically, like there's nothing I can do, like I'm just going to go for the ride here. You have no reason to, to have fear or panic. It's just, this is mm. what it is, you know? Well, it's in God's hands, I guess, you know, the whole Jesus believe. take the wheel thing, literally, when you think of it that way. Right. It, yeah. I mean, uh, wow that's that's crazy that's crazy stuff and and uh you know you survived that which is fantastic but it, but it kind of uh set you on the path that you're on now and you're helping people with, mm -hmm. with your tremendous knowledge and your podcast is awesome i i listened to your recap of 2019 you did a lot of stuff last year <laughs> a lot of speaking a lot of uh 
you know, you joined the syndicate, the Arte syndicate, you went to Ed's house in like Idaho, we always talking about hearing about that, mm -hmm. some ridiculous house that he has out there. And then you helped a lot of people. Um, actually, when you began to do your coaching, you did it for free, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Which a lot of people probably wouldn't accept that and probably wouldn't do that. But um, you did that and you helped many people. And I guess that's part of giving in order to receive, right? Yeah, I think that that's that's always been my really my the way I operate for my businesses is I try to build the audience and create value before I monetize it. I think many people try to monetize and earn something too soon mm -hmm. and they, they just become just like everybody else and they fail because they don't understand that you have to build that trust. You have to build that audience. You have to build that value that you're going to create. And then when the time comes, you can always monetize and then people will show up for you. So you have yeah. to be patient. You have to be willing to do that. And I, I teach people that now. It's like people come up to me and say, hey, Tony, I want to start this business. I said, will you be willing to do that for free for one to two years? And they're like, oh, no. And I was like, then you're not serious about it. Because yeah. that's, that's even the hard truth. Like people out there with businesses trying to start something and they're going to bust ass. That, that first one to two years is rough for an entrepreneur. If you're doing something right, sometimes every dime you make goes right back into the company to try to grow it or get to the first employee or your first seven figures. So there's a lot of times you don't pay yourself. So you're, you literally are working for free. So I hope you have some kind of savings or some kind of a, a full-time job to pay for that. But that's the dedication and that's the thing that most people lack, which they can't get past. And they think that they, if I'm going to show up and I'm going to do something, I should get paid for it. That's the employee mindset that's keeping them from becoming successful because they think, I get paid for my time. I get paid for my dollar or the hour. So I get paid to show up. And that's just not how entrepreneurship is. It's like, if your passion and your purpose is strong enough, you're going to be able to do that stuff for free. And you're going to persevere those hard times. And then when things do come around, you're going to get the rewards. You got to figure it out and keep going forward. That's what I, I had a business up in uh, New Hampshire. I had a brewery. I opened a brewery just by myself. You know, mm -hmm. I had an idea and I opened one. But there were a lot of walls thrown up right in my face so but my my motto is like all right either i can turn around and walk away or i can tunnel under the wall or scale the wall or go around the wall or just blast through the, the mother yep. mother effer <laughs> build, build, build a bridge over the wall throw a ladder whatever yeah there's <laughs> There's, that's yeah. that's that's the entrepreneur mindset we always yeah. look for the challenge and we always look for the solution we we yeah. basically don't take no for an answer you got to figure it out, you know. There's always an answer. There's always an answer. Th there is, yeah. There is an answer. You have to find it, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not in front of you, but you just think about it or, or engage others and have them, you know, kind of coach you, which is what you do. I mean, you yeah. help others in, in, in their businesses and try to get to that next level. Um, and a lot of things you do also, you do a lot of uh, uh, public speaking which mm -hmm. probably, I mean, I want to get into it. We talked about it a little bit before the call, I'm doing the, the 10X stages and, uh, with Pete Vargas. And, and that, that's tremendous. I'm getting tremendous knowledge of that. And I got to join Toastmasters. That was one of your famous uh, mm -hmm. podcasts, uh, which I have to do, and get out there and actually start speaking. You know, I'm just putting stuff together now, but um, got to get out there. I mean, how, how'd you get into, I mean, you were an engineer, I guess, originally, right? And then- mm -hmm. Uh, and then you built these businesses and then you did some coaching and then you got into public speaking. Like, how did you get into that? And also like, I would suppose like if you go in front of a huge crowd, there's gotta be some element of, of fear, right? I guess that, that you would have still. <laughs> and, and how do you overcome that? So the, yeah, the story about the public speaking is, is actually, it's, it became a passion of mine, which I never expected because it was one of my greatest fears. And the thing is, is when I, when I started to think about how am I going to impact this world, I said, okay, I'm going to write this book. So, you know, the book side hustle millionaire, and I'm going to write this mm -hmm. book on teaching people how to take their ideas for business and evaluate those and figure out which one's going to be the best opportunity for success. And then it kind of handholds you all the way into getting your startup. Right. So that's the book I had in my head and people wanted from me. So as I was writing the book, I'm very good at visualizing things and understanding what my goals are. And so I said, I'm going to put this, if I'm going to write a book, I'm going to make a number one bestseller on Amazon. And some people laugh. They're like, oh, you know, only 1% of books do that. You're full of crap. Like you've never even written a book before. Yeah. 
And so I said, you know what? It's on my vision board. Even before I typed the very first word, I put the Amazon number one bestseller logo on the middle of the vision board. So I see awesome. it every time I'd fired up the computer, I use it as my backdrop on my computer screen. So I'd fire up the computer and I'd see all the things that I'm going to be building and working on. And then you know, I fired down at the end of the day, I still see it again to reestablish that. And I said, okay, if other people have become a number one bestseller, which for most people to, to understand, you got to sell between 800 to a thousand copies in the first week. And that's, that's how, that's kind of the number we've always calculated out. Many people have figured this out by now, but you have to have a thousand people show up and buy something from you in the first week, which, yeah, I get that. That is hard. And understanding that I said, okay, I'll, I'll just go, I'm going to go hire some people and, and get some advice from people who have achieved it learn how they did it, learn the strategy and work backwards from the same goal. I'm a marketing guy. I'm a business guy. I can do these kind of things. So mm -hmm. that's what I did. I was just basically set the goal, found people with the experience, worked backwards and got the same results. So it's not a, it wasn't a shocker to me. There's nothing random about things like this. You don't just create a, a awesome book and put it out there and go, Hey guys, my book is done. Like come buy it. And then people no, that doesn't happen. It's about marketing. Yeah. So you could write the very best book in the world. You could create the very best podcast in the world. You could give the best speeches in the world, but if nobody knew who you were or how to find yeah. you, then it wouldn't yeah. even matter. So nope. you have to be a marketer before you can be a speaker. You have to be a marketer before you be an author. You have to be a marketer before you can become a podcaster. You have to be a marketer before you become a successful business owner. Marketing is key. So I understand that very well. I've been doing it for 20 years. I just applied the same principles of social media marketing and digital marketing and things like that to a book. And I couldn't claim to be a book marketer until I got the result. Now I got the result. I was like, well, it still works with books too. Let me go try this podcast. Hey, it still works with podcasts too, right? It's the same thing. It's just a different product, different service. And for me becoming a speaker, as I was writing this book, I still had the fear of public speaking. And I said, holy crap, this could be a good book and maybe somebody's going to want to interview me. What if radio wants me on radio or a television station wants me on television or, you know, some podcast wants me to come be a guest. Like I need to be good at speaking. I need to start investing in that skill to be able to communicate effectively. So I joined Toastmasters and I went every week and I did videos every single day in between those weekly meetings just to, to practice the things that I learned in the, in the classes. So understanding that is, Public speaking is not just about being on stage. Public speaking is one-on-one -on -one conversations. Public speaking is telephone call. Public speaking is doing these podcasts, learning how to speak with vocal inflection and, and conviction and energy and mm -hmm. enthusiasm and vocal variety. Because let's face it, most dudes speak what I, I joke, I call it the old version of Tony's. We call it mono Tony because it's monotone. Most dudes, like I'll go into, I'll go into monotone. This, if you would have interviewed me two years ago, this is how it would have sounded. Hey, Michael, thank you for having me on the show. This is awesome opportunity. I can't wait to share some tactics and, and get into the details. And, you know, this is going to be really fun. Awesome, dude. Thank you for having me on. One volume, one yeah. speed, one tone, one yeah. pace, one cadence, no emotion, no energy, no inflections. These are the things we learn from public speaking skills. So when you learn how to communicate effectively, you become far more influential in every aspect. Anytime you open your mouth, you become more influential when you don't say um and uh and but and like you yes. know and so and all these things that distract from your message. All mm -hmm. that gets combed out when you go join Toastmasters and you apply those principles. Mm -hmm. So I had to invest in myself. And as I started to do that, I started getting pretty good at it. And my group was like, hey, you should go compete in the spring Toastmasters competition. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? Like, I, I don't, I, I'm still scared of public speaking. You want me to go compete in it? And stand in front of a room of hundreds of people with clipboards and they're judging like every motion and word and, and thing I do. I was like, like, yeah, you're good at this. Go do that. So me being the daredevil type, I'm like, okay, I'll go try that. It's, a, it's another fear. I'll just go try that. I mean, it, what's the worst thing that can happen? I just to go out the first round and I lose. Like, cool. And it was an experience. So I've always been that daredevil type and I look for fears to go tackle. And I, I did. I, I took the club level and I won the club level. And then I said, okay, wow. so long, I advanced. How long ago was that? I'm just curious. This was in 2000, late 2018. It was 2018. Oh. Maybe. Oh, far, wow. Yeah. So, so not too long, long ago. ago. And so I advanced to the next round, which is a month later. And it was like the area. So I was going against eight different clubs and I won that one. And then I went to the next one, which was half of Houston and I got fourth place. So it was, 
I was like, okay, maybe there's something to this. Maybe I do have some kind of ability that I've created. I don't call it a talent because I didn't have that until I became a skill. I don't like when people write off things as talents. There's certain things that are talented, you know, within your physical capabilities. Like I, I'm not going to go you know, double hand over a, a basketball dunk on a 10 foot goal. You know, it's just, those would be talents or skills based on your physiological stage. For me, public speaking is a skill. It's just like learning a new language. So mm -hmm. go learn from the best, go practice, go do a lot of reps, get some comfortable doing that, learn, take notes, observe some of the best speakers like Ed Milet was one of my favorite speakers before I was even working with them. So understanding that I just really embraced it. And I said, I, I enjoy doing this. This is a great way to get my message out there, which leads to the stages. It leads to the podcast. It's I've been on television now. I've been on the radio. I've done all these things that I have vision that was going to happen because I was just being prepared for those opportunities. Mm. Yeah. And I did the podcast. Uh, like people say, Oh, I'm going to wait. I got to learn this and learn that. And I'm like, nah, I'm just going to do it. You know? And I had a mentor actually, he's a Mark Metry. He's like, he was 21 when he, he kind of uh, taught me how to put a podcast together and he was kind of my mentor and I, I got him and he gave me a lot of tips, but I just started it. Now I have two podcasts and, it's just you talk about what you what you're passionate about. I had the brewery, so I started a beer podcast, you know, craft beer storm, and now I had all that fear. And and I'm like, society is not addressing fear. I don't think you know it's the root of a lot of stuff. It just stops people in their tracks. Mm -hmm. it, it it the potential that people can have, and they hear their uncle say, "Ah, you don't want to do that. Just stick to your job. It's safe." And then they go, "Yeah, you're right." And then their whole freaking life. <laughs> their whole life is in a different trajectory because of that one kind of moment where, and this stuff happens over and over again. So, um, you know, yeah, there's uh, actually a quote. There's a quote that I put in the back of my book and it was my quote. And I'll show you on here cause you can see a camera, but the listener, I'll read it for it. But let me see, maybe you can read it. You can read that, right? Fear and confidence are both imaginary you simply decide which one to live with. <laughs> That's it. They're both imaginary. They're, they're not tangible. Fear and confidence are not some object that you can carry in your pocket. They're basically mm -hmm. exist only in your head. So when you understand that it's imaginary, you get to pick which one you want. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. You know, I mean, it is, it's, it's created and you, you pick mm -hmm. two paths, you know, yep. either you cower or you just move forward and say, no. I, I find, I find that people focused on the potential downside far more than a potential upside of a decision. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times fear is based on what you can lose. What do I, I'm going to lose all this. I'm going to lose all, oh, I can lose everything. I can go bankrupt. I can, you know, lose my reputation, like lose, lose, lose. That's what they focus on. But a lot of times when you really focus on an opportunity that you need to make a decision on, the potential upside is far greater, far greater, but they focus on the little minimal stuff they can lose, which is fear. And uh, yeah, you could be comfortable. Ray Dalio in his book, uh, he says there's like a jungle and you could stay on this side of the jungle and have a nice life and be very comfortable, or you can cross through that jungle and it's not going to be pleasant. But when you get to the other side, you, you'll have something great, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of people don't cross that jungle. They just play it safe. And I believe what you're saying about the fear, people choose, look at the fear and they choose just not to do anything because it's easier. Mm -hmm. It's just, oh, well, I can't do it because of X, Y, Z. And then they create all these excuses and they just don't do it. Yep. Discomfort. They'll avoid it at all costs. Most people. But you have to be, I'm reading the book by uh, Jesse Isler, the uh, living <laughs> yeah. with the seal. Did you ever read it? Holy I have not, cow. but yeah, I know this. I know the book very well. You got to read yeah. that thing because he was leaving with Goggins, right? So, <laughs> and Goggins put him through hell like every day. It was awesome. <laughs> but, 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 but Goggins is like, you know, you always have to push yourself. You cannot, you can never be comfortable. A lot of people who say that, you know, if you, if you uh, just keep pushing yourself, just do things that are uncomfortable, mm -hmm. you're going to grow as a person. I mean, that's what when you lift weights, right? You, you push against something. Mm -hmm. and your your muscles break down but then they grow stronger and it's the same thing with anything you know it's, yep. it's just pushing through it so I, I i actively look out for things that i have some kind of fear or hesitancy about and that i take mental note of that it's like i'm gonna go conquer that now like i'll actually look for that kind of stuff it's that's where the growth is anytime you have a fear that you need to face that's where the growth is 
it is and a lot of times the 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 you know if you're fear talking to a person and you know you just don't do it and if you get the the balls to do it usually the 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 end result is totally different than what you thought that's right you know so go out and have that conversation go do that thing take that chance and uh you know I had Kristen Ulmer on. She's an extreme skier. She's like named the, the most fearless woman in the world. Cause she used to do like friggin' those ski videos. Like it's like a no fall zone. Like she jump off a cliff. If like you can't fall, you're dead. And she did that for 12 years, but she embraces fear. Like she's like, take fear and embrace it, go and, and embrace it and use it as a tool, you know, and live with it. Because if you, if you crush it, like, she, I'm like, all right, but now I got to change the, my podcast name. If you crush it, you're really just putting it aside, and but it's going to come back. Yeah. You know, so I, I look at that and I take that, and I'm like, you know what, you're right too. You know, uh, but fear is always, always there, and that's why you do, uh, why you avoid doing the the hard stuff that uh, that you need to do in order to grow. And a lot of people are just very complacent, and I, I found a lot since I've gone on this journey. I guess you know the Arte and learn from Ed and Andy. Just I have a lot of mediocre people around me. And you you mentioned it in your podcast, like for the recap of last year. Um, you, you took a list of, of like all the people that you knew and you went one by one and you said, we just got to get them out of our lives or distance ourselves from them because they're just sucking energy out of us. Mm -hmm. And yep. their attitude is just so piss poor that it's just bringing us down and we don't want to be around them. And it was a very hard decision for you to make. I mean, you went to their weddings, you were friends for 20 years. And I know a lot of people like that too. And, you know, and I, I've been trying to distance myself from these people. I'm like, oh, why don't you, you know, want to come to, I'm like, I just, I, I can't, I can't do that. I'm sorry. And then, but it's hard to find people. I found a lot of people in RIT where they think like me and they want to go for it. And I made a lot of good friends. I haven't met a lot of these people, but I see them on the screen and I, mm -hmm. I, I talk to them on the phone and, they, and, and we all kind of support each other. Even if it's by text, we send a text like, yeah, go, go girl, you know, go crush it. You know, or, Dude, you or, don't, hey, you, I, awesome. don't, I don't think that you have to have friends in your zip code. I think nowadays with technology and you and I are both doing a video conference right now, we don't have mm -hmm. to limit friends to people in our proximity. That's no. very, that's a very limiting mindset. You'll find far more yeah. supportive people that you can find that are like-minded and supportive and, and will challenge you and call your BS. Like those are the people that you want to be around. You don't yeah. need to think it's a zip code thing because yeah, I would say that I've got three local friends and, and hundreds mm. outside of local. So yeah, don't limit yourself. If you're listening to this, find those people online. No, absolutely. And the, and the Zoom and, and people online and the communication that we can uh, do with people anywhere in the world. You know, I just connected with a lady in Australia. I'm helping Ed out with his new, he has this new company and I'm, I'm starting to get involved in that. And I recruited somebody from Australia and I knew her from Arte. And she's like, you know, you're one of the only people that I really try. She trusts like four people. I'm like, it's one of them. And I'm like, look, I'm doing this thing for Ed. Do you want to go in? He's like, well, I'm not there, but I'm going to move there next year. I'm like, don't worry about it. I got it. You know, just mm -hmm. sign up and we'll do it together. You know, she's like, all right, I'm in, you know, and cool. she's like in Australia. I never met her, but I, we had conversations, you know, and that that's the kind of people that you got to be with, you know, and, yeah. and kind of the people that are, you know, real people and they're willing to take chances, not crazy chances, but, you know, but sometimes crazy, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. you know, take those risks that are going to move you forward. And she's like, I'm in, let's do it. I'm like, cool. Let's do it. And that, you know, that's the kind of people that I want to hang around with. And uh, that's the kind of people that, uh, that build you up um, and uh, move you forward. So that's cool. Hey, it's been aw awesome, man. What is that? About 48 minutes. I said 30. See, we went 48 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but that's great. I appreciate your time, Tony. This is tremendous that you came on. Uh, I appreciate all you're doing with the, uh, the podcast and you're helping a lot of people. Uh, you've helped me a lot. I took a lot of notes. I don't know if you saw me. I took a lot of notes and um, you're helping people in Arte, which is fantastic. And, um, you know, I think it's just a, a great group to be a part of. And, um, uh, you know, finally, I, I find some people that, that think the way I do. So I'm not really crazy, I guess. Right. But but um, I appreciate you being on, Tony. Really, it was great. Hey, thank you for the opportunity, man. So if anybody wants to find me, just go to my website, 365driven.com. 
and you'll find links to everything that I'm involved with. And I look forward to hearing from you. If you got any good feedback or questions for me, I'd be happy to hear from you. That's excellent. You got your book, right? Side Hustle right. Millionaire? The bestseller. Awesome. I need one of those. Got to get one of those. <laughs> you got plenty of time right, to read right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. All right, Tony, thank you very much. That's, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you.